All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. And uh, it's great to have you out with us today. And I hope that you've had a great week. I was telling the uh, first hour here, uh, as we're going through our new series, our new series, One Another, if you're able to come out for that at 930, we'd love to have you join us. It'll be an encouraging, uplifting, and I think a helpful series to learn more about how we're supposed to be connected as the body of Christ. Uh, but I was telling the, uh, the the previous hour that, you know, being a pastor and being in pastoral ministry, uh, one of the, I guess, uniqueness of it is that every week and sometimes every day is very different. And, uh, you know, I've been able to work some secular jobs before I went into pastoral ministry, and I was blessed with that. But this past week was one of those. I was thankful for the opportunity uh, this past Thursday, uh, just a few days ago, to do the Eastvale National Day of Prayer. And that was a cool opportunity to be able to uh, gather with other Christians in our community and be able to just uh, approach the throne of, uh, of God with, uh, with boldness and be able to pray for our churches and for our military, our first responders, our community uh, and such, and just to be able to uh, beseech the Lord on that. And it was great to come alongside even those that we might be a little bit different in certain areas. I'm thankful that we can come together in unity in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was great to be able to bathe that day and really our, our city and our community in prayer. And I was privileged to be able to pray for our churches and to be able to get connected with other pastors in the area. And I'm looking forward to following up with that. And then later on that day to attend a funeral service. Um, I was supposed to mention this actually a few weeks ago, and I apologize for that. Uh, but Derek, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, uh, but Derek, uh, Derek and Sandy have been coming to our church now uh, for a bit. And Derek's son passed away. Uh, here a few weeks ago, and they would definitely cover your prayers. Obviously, we don't want to bombard them or anything. We're going to give them privacy and, and all of that, but uh, I was able to be a part of that funeral service, and it was a beautiful one. People spoke from the heart. It was it was raw. It was intimate. It was genuine, and by the way, that that's, that's how it should be. You know, when you're going through a difficult time in your life and you're talking about somebody that you love, uh, there should be a rawness to it that just shows that that transparency and that love and all of that. It was a beautiful service. We were able to uh, go over to the gravesite there. They lowered the cast, go over to the home and just be able to spend time together and uh, there for a bit. And then that evening to have our Bible study. And uh, as we kind of took a break from our overview of different books of the Bible, it got into what does our walk look like? Uh, really going back to the person of Enoch and how we walk with God and how that, that was such a treasure uh, there to Methuselah and Noah, and how that they benefited from having a man in their life who walked with the Lord, uh, walked with the Lord and demonstrated that as an example. And uh, yesterday, we had our couples connect. Now, we were supposed to have a couples retreat, and unfortunately, there were some things outside of our control that limited that, and so we had to make some adjustments. We ended up doing a couples connect, and I appreciate Patty and Fernanda opening up your home. What a beautiful home. And uh, we had a great time. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we had a great time, and we got a big breakfast. Who likes to eat? Yes, it was good. And uh, we had a good time. There was bacon. Did I mention bacon? You know? And uh, we had a good time together. And uh, we had a session just talking about relationships and couples and actually how to resolve conflict. You ever had a dealt with conflict in your relationship? If you have it, you're lying. <laughs> we all deal with conflict and how to resolve conflict from a biblical mindset. Then after that, uh, we were able to uh, go over to an escape room, a few of us, and it was great to have Jacob and Savannah, uh, and uh, my wife and I do an escape room. Who's ever done an escape room? Let's see where you're at. Raise it high. Let's see where you're at. Okay, those hands are up. Okay, wait. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up <laughs> if you beat it. If you didn't beat it, put down your hand. Okay. All right. All right. That's good. That's good. So you did pretty well. Now, who said, yes, I was able to escape with 10 minutes to spare? Keep your hand up. You're able to escape with 15 minutes to spare. Who says we barely escaped? Well, it was pretty cool. Yesterday, our, our first one, yes, I did say first one, because uh, we had so much fun, we had to do it again. Uh, but our first one, we got out, what was it, 16 minutes? 16 minutes. Yes. You now know who to go with you at an escape room. <laughs> Specifically, Riza and Savannah, because Jacob and I were no help. But no, it was a great time. We went back and did their actually the hardest one. We had six minutes to spare. That was a lot of fun uh, with all of it. But uh, it was great to be able to spend some time with new friends and then also just have a little bit of fun. Uh, kind of a double date there. We're going to be doing a couple's connect in the near future again. That's something I, we want to do more regularly. 
We'll have announcements about that and make sure you have plenty of time in advance to be a part of that if you're able to. Uh, really focusing on the Saturday mornings. So that's usually when we have some time off. But we had a great time then obviously today uh, in the house of the Lord. Well, here, since I've been here, we've been able to go through two particular books of the Bible. Uh, we preached through the book of Philippians. That took us several months to get through. And then most recently, we got through the book of, what was that? Jonah. I'm glad one of you were paying attention. And uh, yeah, we got through the book of Jonah. That took us a couple of weeks to get through. Today, I am excited that we are jumping into another book. This is the book of Colossians. And uh, I have entitled this series, Jesus is Enough. Jesus is Enough. We're going to look at some of the background of this and kind of walk through, but just so you know, this is a prison epistle. These are This is part of the letters that Paul would have written from under house arrest in Rome, just like he did in the book of Philippians and others. And so we're going to kind of walk through this. This actually closely ties in with the book of Philemon, and we'll probably get to that here in the coming months as well. But if you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 1. And let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word if you're physically able. Colossians chapter 1. And verse 1. Colossians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother, verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. I want you to read the last part with me together. Ready? Begin. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord what? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you be with this message today. Lord, strengthen us. Lord, help us to remove any distractions in our life. I'm sure all of us have busy times, and maybe had a busy week or have a busy week coming, that we just pause the plans, that we pause the busyness of our mind, that we wouldn't be scattered abroad in our minds thinking about everything other than what we are here today, and that is to learn from your word, be edified in scripture, to grow in our relationship with you, and to be a testimony and witness for you throughout our week. Help us, Lord, to just sit here, to listen to your word to hear it, and to do something about it in application. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This is going to be kind of a different message today. And uh, typically, I don't just do two verses. <laughs> I like to jam-pack it. I like to get it all in. And I really wanted to do multiple verses this morning. But as I prayed about this and really was studying out this book now for, for several weeks, it really became evident that I want to make sure that we understood some of the background, the context of this book, and really kind of dig in and kind of an entry-level intro before we really start flying through this beautiful, rich, doctrinal book that talks about that Jesus Christ is enough because he is God. And uh, if you uh, were to look at the book of Colossians, you'll see that it only has four chapters. It's not a very long book. As a matter of fact, Paul's letters typically aren't, weren't very lengthy. Paul had, a, had an ability of just getting right into it and, and dealing with the issues at hand. And uh, like the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is a book that is written about the body of Christ. And the first half of the book is a doctrinal book, really breaking down that core doctrine of ecclesiology. Then the last half of the book is dealing with the practical application of being the body of Christ, the church that's living for the Lord. Well, the book of Colossians is a doctrinal letter from Paul, and it deals with Christology, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And the first half, the first two chapters, is dealing with the rich doctrinal truths of that. And then the last two chapters are dealing with the practical application of how that works out in our life. If you will, Jesus Christ is preeminent because he's God. But in the last two chapters, Jesus Christ is preeminent, so he ought to be Lord of your life. Do you see kind of the breakdown there? Paul's very good at bringing in rich truths in a way that we can understand, but he doesn't leave us there. He brings the application, how that applies to our day-to-day -day life. So I want to get into the book of Colossians. This series I've entitled, Jesus is Enough. Now you might ask, why the book of Colossians? <laughs> There's a lot of different books in the Bible. There's 66 of them. Why don't we get into the book of Colossians? It's a document that was written 2,000 years ago. Perhaps those, and you've heard this maybe from others, maybe you've had this thought, what possible relevance could a book or a letter written 2,000 years ago have on me and our culture today? I want to show this by way of introduction. Let me tell you why. We live in an age of reason, right? An age where science is revered by people, and understandably so. 
There has been an exponential increase in scientific knowledge and discovery. Uh, discovery. I saw a statistic. I don't know if it's necessarily true, but it's a statistic that many people use that 90% of the scientists who have ever lived actually live today in our society today. It's very prominent, the scientific advances that we've had in recent times. You think of just the last hundred years. My great, great grandmother was born in 1896. She died in the year 2000, just before her 104th birthday. Can you imagine the technology advances that she saw in her lifetime? 1896 to the year 2000, right? There would have been a lot of just huge improvements when it comes to what we can do with technology today. Science has rapidly moved forward with that, with scientific knowledge and, and discovery of things. But something has happened due to this exponential increase in scientific understanding in recent, in recent years. Science has seemingly been elevated to savior status. We heard for years, follow the science. Did we not? And by the way, have you noticed that science changes? Doesn't it? Oh, look, I'm not trying to be political. That's not what this is about. I'm just stating a fact. Science changes. We learned that this, what they thought was good, and then come to find out maybe it wasn't so good. Science changes over time. And what people actually meant by follow the science actually was really just follow the scientists that we like and agree with and ignore the rest. Now, is God outside of science? Is God outside of science? It's a very simple answer. It's not a trick question. And the answer is? Okay, that's like three people going, I'm not sure, so I'm going to say, eh. the answer is, it's N-O. The answer is, no, God is not outside of science. And by the way, Colossians gives us that answer. Colossians 1.16, for by him were what? All things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by who? Him and for him. So this is an age of reason, our day to day. But also we live in an age of division, don't we? It almost becomes this great divide that seems to be growing more and more and more. In recent years, our nation has become a very divided people ideologically, but also politically. And in the midst of it, people are saying, well, Jesus is good. Jesus is a good person to look to. Jesus' teachings can be helpful, uh, but he certainly is not enough. Oh, no, no, I don't think we need more than Jesus. We need Jesus plus whatever they would want to insert. You need more than him. You need Jesus plus this ideology, or you need Jesus plus our political category or slant. Colossians has something to say about that as well. Colossians 2.10 says this, it's in your notes. And ye are what? Complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So we live in an age of reason, in an age of confusion as well, especially regarding Jesus. You see, most people today think of Jesus as one of many options of religious possibilities. I'll add them to the smorgasbord of different faiths and beliefs that I've talked to. And by the way, if you've gone out and talked to anybody in any span of time about the gospel, you will find this is a very prevalent and growing part of our culture today. It's, well, I dabble a little bit with this faith, and I kind of like the ideas of this faith, and I like that how that this, this faith might lead me in a certain morality and such. And don't get, me, don't get me wrong, I appreciate moral good people. We need more of that in our world today, don't we? But to say that when it comes to my eternity and when it comes to my beliefs, to simply add Jesus to a bunch of other smorgasbords of religions and say it's all the same is intellectually dishonest. Because it's not. One claims one, the other claims another. So what would be right if they're both conflicting or all of them are conflicting? See, most people today think of Jesus as one of many options, and there's a popular bumper sticker that has come out in the last several years where they take the icons of different religious systems and they spell the word what? Coexist. Co right? That's kind of a, I mean, if we're just practically speaking, that's kind of a genius thing that somebody did. Obviously, it was a good marketing ploy. People bought into it and such. The message behind all of that is, hey, you religious folks, 
Get along with each other. Stop fighting. Work together. Really, you all just believe the exact same thing, so just get along. It's all the same God. It's all the same worship system. Just get over yourselves. Colossians has something to say about that. Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. By the way, that's not talking about just in the sense of, uh, of, of a time. He was the first. I was talking about ownership. The fact that he is over every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is what? Before all what? Things. By him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in what? All things he might have. The preeminence. He is supposed to be number one, not just simply one among many. So it's not only an age of reason, it's not only an age of division, but we also live in an age of confusion. And the clarity that this book brings to confusing times is something that I think we all need today, right? Now, many people have experienced the amazing work of the gospel throughout the centuries, and praise the Lord for that. The gospel of Jesus Christ truly changes lives. Churches develop, Christians thrive, many are brought to the saving faith of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, there have also been those throughout history that have entered into these churches that preach a counter gospel that begins to sway young babes in Christ with their inclusive teaching. Things that try to pull away from the solidity of that we are complete in Jesus and Jesus is enough. These young Christians begin to doubt in the sufficiency of Christ and wonder, really, can Jesus be enough? It sounds like I need more. The book of Colossians is written. Series always listen. The book of Colossians is written to a church going through this exact situation. Its pages ooze with powerful Christological meaning that effectively combat the attack on Jesus and answer with an affirmative, Jesus is what? Enough. So number one, if you're taking notes, I want to look at Paul's concern. Paul's concern. Look at verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of who? The will of God. And Timotheus, our brother. So who wrote the book of Colossians? Paul did, right? Kind of goes right there, but we can also see this in Colossians chapter 4, verse 18. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be with you, amen. It's kind of interesting. Critical scholars in recent days have actually attacked this idea that Paul was the author of this book. Because the stylistic or the literary style of it is a little bit different than some of his other epistles. But make no mistake, Paul had a, had a style of writing where that he would change his style depending on the issue at hand. And this issue that he's dealing with required a very affirmative, abrupt response. And that's how he did it. And we know right here in this book that the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Now, Paul cited his apostolic calling and office at the start of this letter in order to lend authority to the teachings that we're about to follow. Hey, I'm an apostle. Now, remember, when it came to the church at Philippi, he knew that church. He was close to that church. He was friends with that church. So it was a brother in Christ, right? A bond servant to you. But here he's not talking about how that we're close. He's talking about his authority and being able to teach what he's about to teach on. He is an apostle of God that's going to teach this doctrine of Jesus Christ. I like what William Barclay says here. Uh, says here, here, right at the outset of the letter, is the whole doctrine of grace. You see, a man is not what he has made himself, but what God has made him. There is no such thing as a self-made man. There are only men whom God has made, and men who have refused to allow God to make them. You think of all the accolades and abilities that Paul had, right? This was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. This was a man that was of the tribe of Benjamin. This was a man who, who, who was staunch in his beliefs, a man that was so staunch in his beliefs, he carried it out with such vengeance and such zeal and such passion that he persecuted the church. This was a man that when he stood among Jews, he would have been head of shoulders when it came to simply his pedigree. And yet he said, I am nothing without God. 
It is by God's will that I am who I am today. And with that, I hold to the authority that God has given me, not what my works have done for me. So who is Paul writing to and where are they located? Paul is writing to a church located in the city of Colossae. Now, the inhabitants of Colossae were mainly Greek colonists and native Phrygians uh, when Paul wrote this epistle, but there were Jews and a good amount of Jews that would have been living in this area as well. Colossae was located in Asia Minor by the Lycus River Valley, and it was a little over 100 miles from Ephesus. You remember that city? Ephesus, that's where we get the book of Ephesians. And, uh, and it was within 15 miles of Heropolis, but also catch this city, Laodicea. Do you remember that city? That's right out of the book of Revelation. So it's very close to the church at Laodicea. And uh, it, w- it had been a prominent city at one point in history, known for its textile industry. Uh, they specifically were known for a red wool that became known as the Colossian wool. They were in that textile market, and there was a highway that really brought a lot of people to them. However, as history continued and as time advanced on, the highway was then moved to a, a different town, moving the major highways. And so now at this point in history, when Paul is writing to this church at Colossae, it was simply a forgotten city. It was a city that no longer had the prominence it once had. It wasn't really well known. It wasn't a major city. As a matter of fact, most uh, uh, Bible scholars would say we really wouldn't even think about Colossae if it wasn't for having a letter to the church at Colossae. And so this wasn't necessarily a prominent, big, mega church that was just out there winning souls. No, this was a church that was just living for the Lord, no matter the size, and in an insignificant city that wasn't as well known as others around them, like Heropolis and Laodicea, Ephesus. It was about a thousand plus miles away from Rome and such, but it was still a city that meant the world to God. And Paul was then orchestrated to help this church that was going through issues. Now, when, when did Paul write this letter and why did he write it? Now, while there has been some debate as to when Paul wrote this epistle, I believe it's pretty obvious, at least to me, that Paul wrote this during his two-year imprisonment in Rome. That's mentioned in Acts 28. That's where we get that this is one of the prison epistles. This would have been around AD 60 to AD 62. And while Paul was imprisoned in his rental house in Rome, Epaphras came to him with a problem. Now, many believe that Epaphras was probably one of Paul's students. This is pretty cool. In Acts chapter 19, we know Paul being at Ephesus and teaching in the school of Tyrannus. While I was teaching at the school of Tyrannus, there was these, if you will, these, these students in his school that then were dispersed out to go plant churches. Many believe that Epaphras came from this school and planted the church at Laodicea and the church at Colossae. And now he was the pastor of this church in Colossae. This would have been around AD 50s or so. Epaphras evidently captured the heart of a church planner is widely credited for founding uh, this church as well as others in Heropolis and Laodicea. Now Paul is writing as you read this book because a serious problem has developed. And by the way, it is such a serious problem that it motivated Epaphras to take a journey from Colossae to Rome, which was over 1,000 miles, to visit Paul to tell about the problem and get some help. Now, you understand they didn't have modern transportation uh, opportunities like we do today, right? How long would it take you to drive 1,000 miles? Some of you are going, I can do that pretty quick. You know, it would take us some time, right? Uh, however fast you're going, say you're going 70 miles an hour. I mean, if you went 10 hours a day, it's going to take you you know, roughly, probably about eh, a day and a half, depending on how many times you're going to stop, grab a bite, or whatever. They don't have cars. They didn't have flights. This was a long journey to make. And it just shows you the, the intensity and really the situation that was brewing that seemed to spark this from Epaphras and actually seemingly scared him to where he needed help to resolve a potential issue that was coming. The response of Paul from Epaphras coming to him and talking to him is the very book of Colossians. So what's going on in Colossae? It's what Bible commentators refer to as the Colossian heresy. The Colossian heresy was a belief system that was a mixture of both Greek philosophy, Greek mysticism, and Jewish legalism. That sounds like kind of a mixed pot, doesn't it? So you got Greek philosophy, Greek mysticism, and Jewish legalism. This teaching then promoted Judaistic ritualism and traditionalism. 
You, you can see this in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, verse 11, verse 16, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. You can see that they're talking about how he's dealing with this traditionalism, the, the legalistic uh, 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 practices of Judaism. But also, this Colossian heresy talked about ascetic self-denial. This is where it was just kind of denying yourself. You see this in Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. Next, you see the veneration of angels in Colossians 2, 18 through 19. And you say, well, what does veneration mean? It's essentially the worship of angels. Now, does God call us to worship angels? Who are we called to worship? God, right? Jesus. And so we're not called to worship angels, but they have this mysticism about them that they have the veneration of angels. And that only those, catch this in their teaching, that only those that have the full knowledge of the truth that they taught were spiritually mature or enlightened. So if you don't believe what we taught and, and understand what we taught, then you're not spiritually enlightened or mature, right? You see this in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, verse 28, and Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. So this is really, a, in a way, a smorgasbord of different beliefs, right? It's kind of this huge, almost elitist, intellectual teaching that is trying to invade this church. This belief system actually would metastasize throughout history. By the second century AD, this belief system became known as Gnosticism. Now, at this time, we don't believe this was Gnosticism. It was beginning to form and develop. But have you ever heard the term Gnosticism before? Anybody ever heard that before? It's kind of a unique thing. It's not something that we necessarily deal with on an everyday basis, but uh, have you ever heard the, the word agnostic? Now, agnostic, what does that mean? Well, agnostic just means somebody who doesn't know. Right? It's somebody who says, we just can't know. Is there a God? I don't know. That's what makes an agnostic. We really can't know, maybe, maybe not, but I really can't land on that, so I don't know, so I'm an agnostic. And by the way, we talk about atheists and agnostic. Most that I've encountered are actually agnostics. They're not atheists. And so if you meet a true atheist, let me know. I'd love to converse with them. Now, gnostic would have been the opposite. Gnostic refers to somebody who knows everything. Okay? Not an agnostic, but a gnostic. They're in the know, if you will. They're kind of part of that elite group. And uh, you can't know what they know, but a Gnostic can help you know what they know. But you have to go through these mystical, legalistic kind of formats to get there. Essentially, they, with their teaching, can enlighten you to true wisdom. But you have to go through their teachings. That's what they claimed. Now, this belief system grew from a philosophical question, by the way, and it's a question that many people ask even today. And here's the question. Why is there such an evil world if a good God created it? You ever heard that question? Have you ever asked that question? It's something you look around our world and you see prevalence of evil, destruction, brokenness, trauma, tragedy, all of that. And you think, how could this, how could this be, right? Why is there so much evil in this world? How can there be such an evil world if a good God created it? So these Gnostics developed a solution. And there were different elements in this belief system. I won't get into all of it, but to simplify it a little bit, first of all, they said, well, God is good, which by the way, that's a good assumption because God is good. But they took it too far. All matter in the material world is evil. So God is good, but matter is evil. Therefore, God did not create the world. <laughs> That's kind of a unique kind of leading there, right? A lot of assumptions there. Now, who did create the world? This is what they said. They said an emanation that proceeded from God created the world. They didn't say that there was thousands upon thousands of emanations. Angels and little g-gods went out from God until there was an emanation so far from God that that emanation didn't even know who God was. And that emanation created the material world. Who's ready to buy into that philosophy? That's crazy. They believe Jesus was simply an emanation, albeit a good one, and like a good angel. But because Jesus was a good emanation and the material world is evil, they said Jesus did not have a physical body. 
that if you saw somebody walking, it was a phantom that you saw. It wasn't a real material person because a good emanation would never have a material body because matter is evil. So they had all these crazy stories. Like, Jesus would walk on the sand but never leave footprints because he wasn't in a real physical body. They also had a mixture of Jewish legalism in their belief system. Some sort of rigid self-denial. They emphasized a certain diet. They dietary restrictions, uh, holy days, new moons, festivals. That's a whole lot going on, isn't there? But as we go verse by verse through this book, this letter that Paul wrote, we will see Paul's answer to this belief system. Paul will say, Jesus Christ is God. He's not simply an emanation. We will see Jesus Christ is God with a human body, not just a phantom. And in Jesus is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, not some weird teaching. It's only in Jesus. He's all that you need. You don't need Jesus plus anything or anyone else. Jesus is what? Enough. Now, there's never not a time in history that the church is not in some sort of danger. If you've ever studied out church history and you were to look out through the pages of history, you will see that there was conditions and problems and issues and dangers that were all there throughout prevalent of time history. What? Why would that be? It's pretty easy to understand why that is. Jesus said, I will build my church. Paul the Apostle said the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So if the church is that, and if the church is at the center of God's plan for humanity, then you can expect Satan is always wanting to attack it. You see, what God loves, the devil hates. We often say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which, by the way, is that true? Sometimes we need to remind ourselves of that, don't we? God loves me. He has a wonderful plan for my life. You're going through a hard time? God loves me. And he has a wonderful plan for my life. While that is true, here's another truth. The devil hates you and has a miserable plan for your life. And a miserable plan for the church if we let it. Now, we typically don't deal with Gnosticism. That's not what we are facing. But if we're being honest, there does seem to be an attempt of deconstruction in the church. Progressive Christianity can enter into a church. There are cults in every age that deny the deity of Christ. And so the church is always in danger. So what Paul had a concern for, we shouldn't let our guard down with either. Paul had a concern. There was something trying to infiltrate this church to take them away of the fact that Jesus is enough, and he begins writing. Let's also look at Paul's correspondence. Look at verse 2. Paul's correspondence. To the saints and what? Faithful brethren. What a beautiful title. To the saints and faithful brethren in who? In Christ, which are at Colossae. Now, Paul is writing out a concern for the church. We've already established that. Paul knows there's a heresy that's attempting to invade the church. Paul knows there is a false belief system that people could buy into. And so he begins to write something about that as the Holy Spirit leads him. But I want you to see, he does not begin this letter by immediately going after the false teachers and teachings. He doesn't do that here. He begins by encouraging and affirming believers and by exalting Jesus Christ. Notice the word saints. What does saints mean? The word translated saints literally means holy or separated ones. That's what it means. That simply put, that saints are saved sinners. They're not somebody that has been dead for a while, that a church recognizes and promotes to the, the, the level of sainthood. Saints are simply saved sinners. So truthfully, if you were saved here today, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are a saint. So now we can start calling you Saint Virgil. My name now is Sir Master Pastor St. Miles. You see, the moment we trust Christ as our Savior, we are declared saints in Christ. Paul makes this abundantly clear in his greeting to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, 
Called to be what? Saints. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. I like what Dr. John Phillips says. He says, the title of saints is one of great import. It reminds us of what we are positionally, catch that, positionally through the finished work of Christ. Finished, not ongoing, it's done. Finished work of Christ. And it reminds us of what God expects us to be practically as people set apart for him. And then notice the second term here, and faithful brethren, one of the loveliest names in the New Testament for a Christian. Now it seems as Paul wrote that, Paul seemingly anticipated these faithful Christians at Colossae to listen to his letter and respond by removing the false teaching that was trying to infiltrate their church and shake their faith that Jesus wasn't enough. And so once again, Paul doesn't begin by attacking sinners. He begins by affirming the saints and calling them his faithful brethren. Have you noticed that sometimes Christians and even pastors can just be mean and bad? <laughs> Seems like every time you look at their Facebook page, they're just talking about something else they're mad about. Angry. And by the way, we do live in a weird, a weird world and we have to call out sin for what it is. I'm not talking about going away from that, but every time you talk to them or you look at what they're talking about, it's always mad about something. Who loves to hang out with somebody that's always mad about something? Most of us wouldn't. Why? Where is the encouragement in that? Where's the hope in that? I don't want to live in a perpetual state of being mad or angry. See, if we truly desire to win people to the cause of Christ, we must be kind <laughs> as we speak the truth in what? Love. It goes a lot further than just being angry and bitter. By the way, you're not going to bring a lot of people to the cause of Christ if you're always just mad, angry, and bitter about everything. Where's the hope? Where's the excitement in being a part of that? John 13, 34, and a new commandment I give unto you that ye, what? Love. love one another. We actually were dealing with this very verse this morning at 930. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. This is a new commandment given by Jesus Christ the day before he's going to be crucified. And this is what he's telling his disciples that were forming the first church. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if what? You have love to one another. You see, I want to be known for what I am for more than what I am against. I hope that you would have the same hope and desire. But I want to add to that and say, we ought to be known by who we are for rather than for who we are against. Who are we for? Jesus. Because Jesus is enough. We can do that by exalting Christ, by encouraging his people, by engaging the world around us, by seeing the gospel flow through our lives with testimony and with action. Faith without works is dead. Look, we have a cause, a commission, a solution to the world's problem, and that's to bring Jesus to them because Jesus is no. So to the saints and faithful brethren his correspondence. Now something else I want to notice really quickly. And whenever a pastor says that, you know it's not quick. <laughs> he is writing to a group of people that has not one, but catch this, two addresses. They are brethren in Christ, which are at what? Colossae. So brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Did you know that as a child of God, if you were saved today, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you have dual citizenship? That's so cool. Who loves to deal with passports? Those that are going to Israel, you better get on your passports. Those that want to go to Israel, come talk to me and we'll get you a passport. No, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but dealing with passports, you know, you got to travel with it. It shows that my wife, uh, she was Canadian when we met. And uh, uh, and uh, she was originally Filipino, lived, grew up in the Philippines. Her family immigrated to Canada. She was Canadian when we met, and now she's an American citizen. She's a dual citizen. Our kids, being first generation uh, children from her, automatically become dual citizens from that. We've got to fill out some paperwork, but they're a dual citizen. I'm just a single citizen. So I'm not as cool as the rest of my family. But the blessing of this is, as a Christian, you are a dual citizen. 
You see, we carry two passports. We have a heavenly passport. We are citizens of heaven, but we also should be responsible citizens here on earth. Philippians 1.27, we talked about this several weeks ago. Only let your conversation, by the way, that's not talking about your talk. That's talking about your citizenship. Only let your citizenship, your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. And what is that? How are they becoming the gospel of Christ? How are they living that out with their citizenship? That they are standing fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for what? The faith of the gospel. See, Paul was reminding these Christians here in Philippians 127 that they were citizens of two worlds. They were citizens of the Roman world and they were citizens of the world that ruled Paul's desires. These two worlds were at war. You see, our Christian nature, the new nature we are in Christ is at war with our old nature. Is it not? We have that internal struggle. The Christian's heavenly citizenship has to take priority over their human citizenship. That's where the preeminent allegiance ought to lie. And by the way, when you do that by prioritizing your heavenly citizenship, this will cause the Christians that do that to be better humans, to be better neighbors, to be better teachers, to be better parents, to be better spouses. When you prioritize your heavenly citizenship, it will have a trickle down effect that makes you a model example of Christ in the world today here on earth. And the same is true today. You see, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, you became a citizen of heaven. And with that citizenship, there are some expectations that we are to live in a manner that demonstrates we have been regenerated by Jesus. You see, you are a new creature in every way when you got saved, not just on Sundays. We could probably stop there for a bit and talk about that, couldn't we? You are a new creature when you got saved in every way, not just on Sundays for an hour and a half in a service. Every day of the week, every situation of your life, when you experience regeneration through salvation, your relationships got saved. Your work or businesses got saved. Your ethics got saved. Your morals got saved. Your marriages got saved. Your ambitions and passions got saved. Jesus saved you. Now we must live like we are saved. 1 Peter 2, 9, that ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, what? Glorify God in the day of visitation. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of the book of Matthew when it says that we are called to be the light of the world reflectors of what God is doing in our life to the very people around us in our life. So right now, I am in Southern California. Right? Maybe. I'm in Southern California. But you know what? I'm also in Christ. So look at your spiritual address. To the faithful brethren in Christ, this is unique. You see, over 80 times the New Testament says that we are in Christ. Do you realize how unique that is? Uh, no other world religion ever talks that way. You're never going to hear a Muslim say, I am in Muhammad. You are never going to hear a Mormon say, I am in Joseph Smith. You're never going to hear a Jewish person say, I am in Moses. You're never going to hear a Buddhist say, I am in Buddha. But you hear Christians say what? I am in Christ. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
Yeah, not I. But Christ liveth me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are not our own. We are his. And that's what it means to be in Christ. Living with that duality every day. I know I live here. I know I should be responsible here on this earth. But I also know that I have a heavenly home and keeping that in mind as well. That is the preeminent thought. Paul is always drawing our attention to the fact that we have a heavenly home that should always be a part of our thought process. Why? Because we are in Christ. That's also one of our struggles, is it not? Should be one of our struggles. If you're not struggling with it, then we might need to talk later. The struggle is how do I honor the Lord? My heavenly home, my heavenly address as a citizen of heaven, being in Christ, but at the same time, be responsible in a very secular, anti-God environment. We struggle with that. We should struggle with that. <clears throat> We're meant to struggle with that. You know how I know that? The Lord Jesus said in John 17, he made this prayer, Father, it's not that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil. John 17, 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. You see, if we are taken as Christians, if we are taken from the world, the world will be in utter darkness and would perish. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. So Christians, shine. <laughs> We're called to shine. If we were taken from the world, the world would not have us as a witness to be a means of salvation unto them. So what are we supposed to do? Go win others to Jesus. If we are taken from the world, we would be denied the opportunity to serve Jesus in the same place we have sinned against him. So serve Jesus. If we were taken from the world, we would not see that there are aspects of God's wisdom, God's truth, God's power, God's amazing grace that are better appreciated on earth rather than in heaven. So see the very glory of God in your life. If we were taken from the world, we would be denied the place to prepare for heaven. You see, there is no purgatory. The Bible doesn't talk about that in any way. Our preparation is now here on earth with our breath. So get ready for heaven. If we were taken from the world, we could not show the power of God's grace to preserve us in the midst of difficulty and trials and tribulations and testing. So what? Continue on. Job, Moses, Elijah, Jonah, they all prayed that they would be taken out of the world. But did God answer that? No. He also wants us to stay in this world, to complete the work that he has commanded us to do. You see, he made it clear that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Don't take them out of the world. I want my Christians in the world. I want them here. We're supposed to be here. This is the address that he has placed you but keep them from the evil one, and that's the balance. Focus on the heavenlies of saying, I am a citizen of God, but with that citizenship, I am also a citizen of this world, and I have a commandment from my God, who is my King and my Lord and my Savior, to reach this world for Christ. But I also want you to look at the church's character. We'll be done. Verse 2, the last part says, Grace be unto you, and what? Peace. From God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, would you just let those two words seep into your soul? Perhaps you've had a long week. Perhaps you've had some trying times. Perhaps you're having a rough several months. Perhaps it's been a rough few years. Perhaps it's just been an overwhelming day. You woke up and you just felt overwhelmed with the burdens of this life. Would you allow God's grace and peace just to seep into your soul and bring that calm that only he can bring in the storm? See, grace and peace, that happens to be the basis for living for Jesus Christ in a world 
that is opposed to him is to have the character of grace and peace. You see, when Paul writes grace and peace to you, this is a very typical way to begin a letter. It's a typical what we call salutation. If you looked at an old Roman letter or a piece of papyri, thousands of them begin letters of correspondence exactly the same way. You have the author, you have the recipient, and you have some word of greeting, like rejoice. But what Paul, the apostle, uniquely does is he combines the greetings of the Western world and the Eastern world, and he tweaks it a bit. You see, Greeks would have said rejoice when they would meet each other. Jews would have come and said shalom, peace, right? Rejoice and peace. But Paul doesn't say that. He says grace and peace. Well, that's very different. Grace and peace to you. You find them in every letter of Paul the Apostle. It's always grace and peace. And by the way, they're never reversed. It's grace first, then peace. It's never peace and grace. And you want to know why? You can never understand the peace of God until you have experienced the grace of God. That's right. That's good. And when you experience the grace, and what does that mean? The unmerited, the undeserved favor of Almighty God. That will produce peace. See, that is the character it produces. So grace is the fountain, if you will, and peace is the stream that flows from that fountain. I want to close by asking you a simple question. And I want you to be honest about this. This is a rhetorical question, but just ponder it for a moment. Do you have peace? Do you have peace? Peace. Listen, do you live your daily life with the experience of peace or are you filled with torment, with anxiety, with worry, or do you live with grace and peace? There's an interesting story. Caesar Augustus, one of the emperors, heard about a man in Rome who owed a lot of money. He was in great debt. And by the way, if you've ever been in great debt, you know that you rarely have any peace. There's always just kind of this weight on you, right? Anyways, this man had a, a lot uh, of debt and, and, and all of that. He owed a lot of money and he was in great debt, but he was very peaceful. This man had a lot of debt. And every night he slept well on his bed. And so this emperor, Caesar Augustus, heard about this man who, had, who owed a lot of money and yet he seemed to sleep peacefully every night. And so he told his men, find where he lives and buy his bed. Because that must be what brings peace, the right temper pedic, right? The right sleep number. Now, of course, we know that you don't get peace that way. You see, peace is the ability to sleep with a clear conscience and heart before God. That's what peace is. Having your mind at ease, your heart at ease before God. Perhaps you're not experiencing peace because you haven't yet experienced God's grace. It is because of this first gift of grace that we can enjoy the second result of our obedience, peace. You see, without God in our lives, it is impossible to experience peace. Isaiah 57 says, peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. One author said, the world can offer a certain amount of pleasure for a season, but it can never offer peace. However, Jesus Christ overcame the world, and thus he offers peace. John 16, 33, these things have I spoken to you that in me ye might have what? Peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I overcome the world. See, although we do receive peace that comes in salvation because of the forgiveness of our sins, God also gives us peace that will carry us through adversity in our lives. Isaiah 26, 3, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Why? Why can we be in perfect peace even in the midst of difficulty, tribulation, and trial? Why? Because he trusted in thee. I trust that God is in control, and that brings me peace no matter the storms raging around me. Maybe as a Christian, you've never turned over the hardship of your life sufficient, sufficiently to let him handle it. 
You see, you can be a child of God and still experience torment. You need to turn over that heartache, that 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 issue, that perhaps bitterness, that that problem, and you need to just give it to God and let Him deal with it right now because He can control it better than you can. He can bring you peace. The Barna Group put out a survey a few years ago. They asked people, if you could ask God one question and you knew he would answer it, what would you ask him? That's a pretty interesting thing, right? Most people said, I'd like God to explain why there's so much pain and suffering in the world. By the way, you would expect that question. But there was a close second one. And here it was. Will there ever be world peace? Will there ever be world peace? Now, we know that world peace will not come until Jesus comes back. But I will also say this. There is peace in this part of the world right here. Why can I say that? I experience peace. I could be in lots of different situations in my life and that are tough and troubling and maybe even traumatic. But I can have peace. That doesn't make me a super Christian. <laughs> and I'm a sinner saved by grace just like anyone else. That means I serve a, a sufficient God who's enough. You see, you too can have peace in your part of the world. You can have God's peace. The tragedy of our world is that we have people out looking for peace in every area of life except for where the peace can truly come from, and that is through Jesus Christ, who freely gives his grace to anyone calls out to him. Romans 5, 1. Therefore being justified, declared righteous by faith, we have what? Peace with God through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, peace can be your experience, but you need to experience God's unmerited favor to get there. See, neither grace nor peace can be purchased or earned. They are beautiful gifts from God as a result of our obedience to him. One person said, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. See, when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, we became alienated from God, could no longer enjoy his fellowship, Man was condemned to die because of our sin and spend an eternity separated from our creator. 2 Samuel 14, 14 says, For we must needs die, and, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither does God respect any person. Yet, catch this, doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. You see, God in his love for us, devised a means to bring us back into fellowship with him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, what? That he gave his only begotten son, that who? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. You see, the Father and the Son work together in love to redeem mankind from our sin and bring us back into fellowship eternally with them. Now, some of you have never even turned your life over to him yet. Perhaps there's someone here that's never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. You don't know what it's, what it's like to even experience the grace, let alone experience the peace. You've never said, Jesus, just invade my life. Just take over my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my King. I accept you as my Savior because I'm a sinner. I recognize religion cannot save me. Works cannot save me. Weird philosophical persuasions cannot save me. But Jesus can. And I want to live for you. I don't want to live for myself. And today is that opportunity for you right now. And why is that an opportunity for you? Because, my friend, Jesus is enough.